It's been, uh, for me, uh, uh, a really an easy transition because a lot of the things that we are doing in Africa was uh, related to infrastructure. Uh, one of the big push was uh, when I was vice president for Africa was for electricity access in Africa and to bring the private sector. Uh, when I uh, was appointed vice president for Africa in 2012, at that time the private sector was not really invested heavily in the generation of electricity. When I left, some countries have uh, even subscribed, oversubscribed IPPs for uh, and the private sector uh, generation in electricity. So moving from there to work on uh, energy worldwide it was a natural thing for me. It's the same in transport. If you look at the, the portfolio of the World Bank, actually the transport portfolio in Africa is one of the largest portfolio of the bank. So for me, uh, moving from Africa uh, to, uh, to the global department of infrastructure, was easy because the two important sectors, which are energy and electricity, was uh, uh, most of the lending that we're doing in Africa region. Right. If we compare your research at the World Bank and, of course, the research from the African Development Bank, we see that there is a huge uh, gap for financing in the infrastructure industry, you know, and uh, this has hampered development in several economies. Tell me, have we or are we yet to find a solution for this? The solution is uh, as is multiple sprung, uh, solution, multiple solution because we need to attract the private sector. We right. need to increase savings from the public sector to invest in areas where the private sector will not like to to come, and we need to be creative and learn lessons on how we've been doing both. So we need to uh, to have more PPPs, particularly in the transport sector. We have some toll roads that we we, we have. And what is objective is to mobilize uh, the long-term savings which is available in the world and to, to bring them to productive sectors in, in Africa. You see all these uh, pension funds, all the institutional investors are sitting on huge uh, 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 amount of money, trillions of dollars. And in fact, if you look at the return of their portfolio, it's not as high as it should be, particularly when they are in countries where the, poli the population is aging. So you have, they have to, 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 to pay the pension of the elderly mm. for a longer time. Right. So there is now an opportunity to match the needs of more developed countries which have large le level of savings with the need of, of African countries which have huge needs in mobilizing long-term investment. Why long-term? Because in fact you, the payback period for an investment in infrastructure is a very long. So if you don't want to, to have a cost of uh, uh, the cost of it to be too heavy on the consumer, on the, on the users, final users, you need to find financing which is matching the amortization period of this very important uh, uh, investment. So that's something that we are, we are focusing very much on, right. and there is now more and more interest from some pension fund. So the other side is to ensure that on the public uh, uh, investment side, that we are the best efficiency and the most efficiency in our investment. Uh, so there is a bit more work to be done right. in planning, in evaluating project, mm -hmm. and making sure that uh, they are corresponding to the priority that are set by uh, countries, and particularly to improve the productivity in our countries. Are you seeing the interest from uh, pension funds, you know, picking up in to invest in, in infrastructure? Because you just mentioned that they're sitting on a, a large amount of uh, cash, but is there the willingness to put this money into infrastructure development? There is a willingness. What are, the, what are the challenges? The main challenge is the risk, per, the perception of risk. When you are a pension manager in an OECD country and you are responsible for the life of, uh, of people because you have to, to pay them their pension, you want to make sure that the investments that you are making are in safe place. And often there is a perception that there, the risk of in Africa is very, very high. So what we're trying to do is to start building an asset class of investment in that sector, which bring confidence and which is backed by some guarantees. So in my department, we have what we call investment uh, finance uh, uh, department, uh, which is working on uh, guarantees, on, uh, on guarantees to help uh, uh, bring in the, 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 the trust that is needed for investors to come in that sector. So this is work in progress. We are making a lot of progress, but there is much more to do. And I think as we will be building that portfolio, I think we'll be accelerating over time because people will see 
that the risk that they were perceiving on, in, in Africa is not as high as it perceives. At the same time, African Af countries should, we, we need to continue uh, uh, working on the macroeconomic situation and uh, watch the, the, the debt level and make sure that the debt level is not increasing too fast and to, uh, so that it, it can jeopardize the macroeconomic stability because that's something also that investors are looking right. to. Today we're talking about the digital economy. But if we look at the investment that has gone into the digital economy, is not really uh, one that you can say is, you know, that much. But if we put it on a scale with the commodities economy, maybe say the likes of Nigeria that is so invested in the oil in the oil market, do you see a time where we'll strike a balance between the digital and the commodities economy? I think that. The most important is to let to create the condition for the private sector to grow in, in. The private sector in Africa is extremely dynamic. I mean, it's quite impressive. When I travel in Africa to see how the young, uh, uh, the, the, the young generation in Nairobi, in Dakar, in Lagos is really inventive, writing new application, doing e-commerce. Uh, they, they are really tuned. They tuned and uh, and they're moving very fast. What is most important is to remove all the, the barriers, all the regulations that stop them being as efficient as young, uh, young people in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley or, or other places. Let me give you an example. So, uh, the reason why M-Pesa grew so fast in, uh, in Kenya is because the, the central bank of uh, uh, Kenya accepted to look at uh, a digital payment as, 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 a, as a way to increase, to increase financial inclusion and to improve ex exchange. Today, today, Kenya now, I think that we're 90 or 95 percent of financial uh, inclusion. So that shows that just by changing the regulation, by accepting to be more flexible and, uh, and, uh, and uh, more, uh, more, more adapted to the, to the new conditions, you can make miracles in our continent. So we move all the bottleneck, adjust our legal framework to make sure that it's adapted to the condition to develop uh, a digital economy. What the government can do more is on education, to make sure that uh, we are uh, bringing in our education system much more uh, 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 training around the digital economy. That means that our IT departments, the way they were conceived 20 years ago in, in a university, should be now uh, revisiting their curriculum to start doing much more big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, because that's what the market now is asking. And that's why this surge of data that you will see in Africa with uh, the broadband access uh, increasing uh, will, uh, will, will allow us to, to be even more active on the, uh, and export much more of our services and goods. Uh, right. When you, look, when you look at the Africa continental free trade area that was signed here just about a year ago, uh, it is interesting because we're talking about boosting the intra-African uh, trade by 52% in just a span of, what, two, three, four years? But when we talk about digital economy again, we're looking at opening up uh, to, you know, cybersecurity issues, right? Now, also, just ages ago, there was a signing of the Cybersecurity Convention, which is not ratified to date. Aren't we just opening up more and all of this data is not protected and we don't have ownership to it? What are we doing here? I think you are perfectly right to raise the issue of cyber security. I think the more we will have access to broadband, the more you will, you will, be, you will be vulnerable to, to attacks. Mm -hmm. And cyber attacks are, are something which are very serious, which is in uh, economies, economies which are more uh, stronger than our economies. So uh, in, uh, in when I'm talking about uh, human capital of training, I think it would be essential to train people in cybersecurity. Actually, during this meeting, I was talking with uh, uh, the ministers of ICT about the possibility of uh, uh, having one or two cent of excellence on cybersecurity and uh, train on the continent uh, a large number of people who can help us protect uh, our, our, our networks, our growing networks. If we don't do that, we, we might really um, uh, reverse a lot of the benefits that we are gaining now of a higher digitization of our economy.